Welcome back to another episode of Small Girl Big Talk. Today, we are continuing on on our Wedding Diaries series, which is where I invite different guests into my podcast to talk about wedding planning, about the preparation of getting into a marriage because I personally am getting married in about a year's time. And I feel like this is such a big part of adulthood that I really want to dedicate an entire series about it because there's so many questions, so many confusion and things that I want to talk about in this topic. And today, I have Esther over here in the podcast. Yes, I am here. And I want to ask you a question. You're talking about preparing for marriage. Is it scary? It is. Hey, I'm, not, I'm still in my process of introduction. <laughs> because I was listening to you and I thought... I really want to know what's so scary about it. Oh, by the way, guys, Esther is a relationship coach, okay? And your question is, what's so scary about it, right? The thought that marriage is a lifetime commitment, right? And like, means I choose this one person and I have to commit for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And it's very scary. Like, what if I make the wrong decisions? Okay, that, that's a valid yeah. fear, which most people uh, would have yeah. in their heads. Mm. But... I, I coach a lot of married couples, right? Mm. Sometimes at the end of the marriage journey. So I just want to commend you for doing this podcast because mm. I feel it's really important that people hear this before they make the choice to get into a marriage. Because they always spend the money, the investment on the wedding, but they never plan for their marriage. Yeah, and I think, yeah. I think I've been quite clear that this whole wedding planning journey, right... The wedding to me is just a party to celebrate mm -hmm. this, the commencement of this marriage. And the marriage is the main part. And I don't know anything about marriage. <laughs> right? It's a good place to start. Yeah. Um, I think the problem with a lot of people these days, why they're so afraid of marriage, is because they know too much. You read on social media, oh, you know what? This is going to cause a marriage breakdown. You know, if your partner gets like you, if you marry a narcissistic person, yeah. like, then everybody gets freaks. It freaks everybody out. Yeah. But sometimes a lack of knowledge is actually good because you get to explore it with your partner together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But so, like, Okay, so the reason that I brought you in, mm. right, the topic that I have in mind is that the things that we should know about our partner or like we should kind of be aware of before our marriage. Like I want to talk about that. Mm. Um, and so you were saying that it's good to kind of, it's a process that's meant to be a bit of like, there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of unknown and it's for me and my partner to, em to embrace it, right? Yeah. But I'm sure there are certain things that we can be aware of Yes, definitely. Right? Yeah. And I think that's what I really want to talk about in yep. this episode. Um, so then, let's start with that. Lah. Okay? Mm. Like, what are certain things that you feel is a deal breaker that I really should know before I get into a marriage? A value system. Okay. Right? Because what drives a person is not emotions. It's actually values. So, like, you grew up with your family background. I grew up with mine we come with different values, right? So you and your partner, it will be the same. So when people get into a relationship, they enjoy being with each other, they, you know, they love the charisma of that person, they're attracted to their looks and everything else. But deep down, it's the value that drives your life moving forward. Right? Mm -hmm. So I always advise young couples, talk more about what's really important to the both of you. Okay, but okay. then my partner is not the kind of person who likes to talk about value, mm. <laughs> right? Like mm. How do you even get into such conversation? You don't have to have like a sit-down meeting every <laughs> single week when you meet each other okay. and talk about values. Yeah. But through spending time together, through the way he talks about his family mm. or the way he talks about his friends or his work, you kind of can gauge the value of a person. That's where you engage in a uh, curious way mm. to find out, hey, why is that important to you? So men don't like um, being put in a place where they feel stuck, they have to talk about something serious. Yeah. Right? It never works. But if you do it in a fun way, recreationally, say, for example, you both are playing, the latest trend is pickleball, and we just had this <laughs> conversation about yeah. pickleball. Say, for example, you're playing pickleball, and you get competitive, right? And then he gets competitive. And through that, 
something might come out from those conversations about, hey, like, you know, how, what kind of person are you? What kind of person am I? Mm. So it's through constant interaction that you kind of find out about the value of a person. Okay. Yeah, it's true communication, la, right? Yeah. Yeah. And just a hypothetical situation because my partner is a lawyer, so mm-hmm. he really can talk and he's, he's very good in communicating. I'm very, I'm very sure. grateful for that. <laughs> but I know some like Asian men generally are not so good in communicating how they feel or talking more about themselves. Um, how do you get around that challenge? of a partner who's just not good about sharing about themselves and talking about such things? It's not necessarily true. Okay. They, usually people give that excuse because they don't want to talk about something that probably feels scary for them or emotional. Yeah. But if, say you get them to talk about sports, yeah. I am sure if he's very passionate about badminton, for example, right? Mm. He'll be talking about Badminton, mm-hmm. um, excitedly, right? Enthusiastically. Yeah. Yeah. So it's about finding that positive trigger in each other okay. to know what is the best time to talk okay. and how do you get into those conversations rather than force it out. Yeah, yeah, I get yeah. Like, like the positive trigger. I was like thinking, how do I bridge from badminton to relationships? But I can, I get it. Like, mm. can even like, you know, just bring in, oh yeah, by the way, this, this uh, player, right, I read up about it that he really very sayang the wife or something like yeah. that, right? And then yeah. kind of like just ease it to it. It's like, oh, what are your values in life and all that stuff, right? And, and it is true, some people might not be so emotionally available. So it's hard to talk about like values. Yeah. Doesn't mean they don't have Mm. Right, so you can also do the scenario where it's elimination. Okay. So just give me a yes or no answer, for example. Mm. Right. So is this important? Yes. Uh, so is that important? No. Mm. Right. So it's not like a fixed way how you want to get into those conversations, but relationship is really accepting who your partner is, mm. and not wanting them to be that version you think they should be. Yeah. So if you are already with a partner that doesn't really talk, yeah. they're not going to change. 10 years, 20 years later, they will still be the same. Yeah. So if you don't accept that now, rethink okay. the relationship. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so that's one thing, yeah. values. What else are there do you think is very important? Um, how, how you view um, family mm. is important because if you are entering into a long-term relationship or marriage, eventually you would think of family. Mm. So you want to know what are their family values, mm. like whether he, he, you know, he's looking to settle down or not. Mm. You don't want to get to that place where you are, you're wanting to settle down and you find out that, hey, actually, they, they don't believe in marriage. Okay. Yeah. Right? Marriage is one thing. I think family planning is another. Mm like this whole having a kid or not kind of mm. thing. And I feel like we are living in a progressive time that most of my friends in my age, right, we are all not sure if we want to have kids. And I think that's a very important conversation to have. But like, have you dealt with such situation, whether it's your client or your friends, in such a way that like, initially at the start of the marriage or even at the start of the relationship, right, both are on the same page. Like maybe both want to have kids. But then down the road, what if I change my mind and I don't mm. want to have kids, right? Mm. Like, that will be a huge problem to the marriage and how? Okay, I, 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 had, I had a couple that they started off agreeing that they don't want kids yeah. because they are both adventurous and they love, you know, spontaneous stuff. They're always traveling between countries. They're shifting places for jobs and they have their own businesses. Then... They went through a 10-year relationship. Uh, they didn't get into a marriage. So one day, um, something changed in the woman. Right? Maybe, I knew it's the woman. Okay, maybe biological clock yeah. or whatever. She felt like she started wanting a family. Yeah. That is when the real conflict happened. Yeah. Yeah. So to cut the long story short, of course, there's misalignment. Yeah. And for the other partner he wasn't ready <coughs> because he went into a relationship knowing he doesn't want a family. Mm. So they have to make that choice at the end mm. how to move forward, whether together with each other or to pursue each other's yeah. 
dreams. Yeah. Right. So it, it's a it's it's a tough question to answer because you never know. Yeah. Right. Like I enter enter my marriage, I never know. I don't know from here onwards what's going to happen in ten years time. Hmm. But I can do whatever I can to make sure I do my part in building that healthy relationship. Mm. So hence, people are so scared about marriage because they have so many what ifs. Yeah, a lot. It's, eh. it's unending, right? Yeah. So kids is one thing. Uh, I would think family. Talking about family is important. Mm. At least, whether you want kids or you don't want kids. Yeah. Or whether career is more important, or maybe fun and adventure. That mm. I, we don't want to be bogged down by serious careers. We we just want to enjoy each other, live with less. Mm. Are you okay or not? Right. So these are some of those conversations that are important to have, right? To have. Yeah. Like even just talking to you about this, right? I'm just thinking like, oh my god, because I'm the kind of person where um, I like to be as prepared as possible, uh. Um, in everything that I do in my career, in my podcast, you can see the way that yeah. I set up everything and all that, right? Oh, but getting into this whole marriage thing because the thing is, it's a two-party thing. Mm-hmm. I can take as much control as I can in the wedding preparation, in the marriage preparation, and all that. I I'm the one, you know, who is here having a podcast with different guests talking about all these things. Yep. And I wonder if my partner ever concerned about all this question, right? Oh, but it's so. <laughs> <laughs> So, hence, knowing too much sometimes might not be helpful, mm. right? Yeah. Probably your partner is on the mindset that, hey, we, we one step at a time. Mm. Our first commitment is we're going to prepare for our marriage, our wedding. Mm. Right? Let's live in the moment. Yeah. Let's just do this well. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I have a question for you. Like, do you think that just love by itself, like my partner really, really love me and I really, really love my partner. Is that all that matters when it comes to a marriage? Ah. <laughs> the real answer is no. No, right? Because love is a feeling. It's that decision to commit that is most important. The love is going to come and go. Mm. right? After, after the first few years of honeymoon stage, you will get stale. The emotions might not be there anymore when you look at their bad habits. Yeah. Or you, you know, you are, you are super annoyed by their behavior. So when the feeling is not there, what do you still hold on to is that decision to commit. Mm. Actually, that is way more important. Yeah. And that decision to commit involves putting in effort, making time for each other, still learning more about each other, discovering each other, accepting each other, learning how to fight better. It's a long journey. Yeah. Yeah, I but think it's fun. Yeah, <laughs> it's long, but it's fun mm. if you put intention into it. Mm. Mm. And so, like you said, like, love comes and go, and commitment is the most important thing, right? Will commitment be able to help you to reignite the love and passion? Like, is it possible? Like, because you know, you've you've heard of stories of people who get into divorce because they feel like oh, they don't love each other anymore. And all that mm. stuff, right? But what if it gets into there's so much what ifs in this conversation, <laughs> I know. right? What if like you get into a point where you really feel like there's no romantic love towards this partner anymore? You don't suddenly one day don't love each other anymore. Yeah. It's years in the making. Mm. So for someone to get to the point and suddenly realize they don't love each other anymore, mm. usually there's something that they probably stop doing mm. or they stop focusing on. Mm. And it's probably quality time mm. or like that that relationship with each other. Mm. Maybe kids came along, mm. kids became their world, right? Mm. Or maybe career came along, work became their world. Or maybe they went through hardships, right? And they couldn't overcome the resentment. Mm. So that eats into communication and over time, you just lose the love. So there's always a cause to why people will fall out of love. Mm. They don't just choose to one day fall out of love. Mm. And if you can rewind that back, with all that you can, I know you have a lot of what ifs. <laughs> so you want to be in control. You really want to be focusing on what really matters mm. in that season that you're in. Okay. Right? Yeah. And the what matters is really dif- differs according to the season, yes. right? And it has, yeah, and you have to be very aware of it, basically. Yeah. And talk more about it. 
Mm. Um, find ways to engage your partner in future talks. For example, uh, even at this stage where I'm, where, where I'm at, I'm 19 years in marriage. Oof, wow. Right? Okay. My, my oldest boy is 17. So my next season, I'm facing it now. I am entering a season where I, I'm kind of an empty nester soon. First, first kid, kind of first kid, yeah. Second yeah. kid is still pretty young, yeah, but, but the first still, kid yeah. is entering university soon, right? Yeah. So it's a different season for my husband and I, mm. and we talk about it like what what would it look like, mm. right? What how would it affect us? How would it affect our family life? So every life transition, you have to have constant conversation about it. Now your conversation is about wedding, yeah. Great, right? Focus on that. Once yeah. you get married, it will be maybe the first investment. Mm. Or maybe, you know, career change mm. Or, you know, family planning yeah. So, if you constantly have those conversations You will feel more in control Because you talk about it Yeah. So, prepare yourself before the challenge comes That is what I'm trying to say Yeah. Like, that means you anticipate a challenge You proactively communicate it first Yeah, yeah Okay, and one of the challenge that I know is definitely gonna hit every relationship like not just even marriage couples it's even mm. like family and friends it's finance and I think coming into marriage the finance talk is very important um, so what are certain things that you feel is very important to be aware of or to have conversations about before committing an entire life together uh, financial expectations okay for example do you expect your partner to be able to provide for you financially mm. yes or no right it's a big question mm. um, and these days women are getting more and more powerful and independent so mm. they could be financially stable on their own mm. still they will hold certain expectation because of their upbringing mm. right so you have to talk about how you view finances in a marriage whether it's half half whether it's you know I don't want to work when I have kids and yeah. you take care of me. Or, you know what, I'm going to continue working and with family side, we'll just find help. I'm not going to be that full-time mom kind of uh, material. All these are financial expectations. Mm. And the other person must be able to accept that and say, okay, let's work through it together. Mm. Right? Or they expect you to share half the cost most of the time. Yeah, and I, I have I have clients where they are in the dating stage. Okay, so this is a beginning beginning stage of dating, right? So usually in the Asian culture, is uh, the men feel pressured to pay for all the meals. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. So he got so resentful over that relationship because he said the girl never initiated once, uh. and it's a huge put off. So he he came and asked me, "How do I bring up this topic?" Okay, so yeah. so it's a real concern. Like, yeah, it is. Do we, you know, ship? chip in money to the same account where we pay from it or do we just share how it goes some people will split to the point where they go on a family holiday or expenses listed out mm. after that they bill each other yeah so but it has to be an agreement first that you talk about uh, what are those expectations yeah so you were saying he asked you how to approach this conversation right how would you advise him then so I would tell him to be upfront to sometimes say hey like before you go on that expensive meal and he said the girl la loves to go for expensive, expensive meals, meals, right? Yeah. So I said, then you have to set the expectation to say, hey, like, if you want to go to that place, it's fine. Are we able to, you know, sh um, share, share the bill? Mm. Be upfront. Because if you can't even be upfront with communication on finances, don't talk about other stuff. Yeah. Right? And he ended up being very resentful. Um, in the end, he broke up. Because wow. they couldn't meet the financial expectation. And he, did he ever had a conversation? About he had. It? Oh, but he the girl came from a family background where the guy should pay for everything. Mm. You should take care of me. Mm. Like, what's wrong with that? Yeah. So that's a clash of values. values. Because you're driven by those values. Yeah. Financial values mm. are, and, and conversations about financial expectations, right? Yeah. And those are more important. The method will come after you agree on the expectations and values mm. for example whether split bank account share bank account that, that, that is secondary okay. to agreeing on actually what's important mm. right maybe this time you are saving for a wedding right so, so that is a financial goal you both can agree with yeah. so that's that one then after that what yeah. right when it comes to our living 
when it comes to every month expenses. Yeah. What does that look like? Then talk about it again. Yeah, I've. I mean, it is a conversation that I sometimes struggle to have, but like I said, like, my partner is someone who is I can communicate with, so it's been. We, we do talk about it, mm. but I also feel like because. Um, so I've been dating my partner for six years now, and even within the six years of just dating, not even marriage yet, there's been growth in ourselves, mm. right? And then things start to change also, yep. even in these stages. Like at the early stages, yeah, we are both just fresh grad, early into working. So everything's everything fine, is fine. Everything's right? split. It's like, oh, it's fair, it's yeah. fair. But then as we get older, I'm like, yeah, but I deserve to be pampered also. I deserve it. Yeah. Like to be treated also and all that stuff, right? Yep. And then things start to change also. And I'm like, wow, this is just dating. Like, you see, then the what if comes yes. in, like, ah. Oh, but like you said, like, I think it's really about a, an ongoing conversation about all these things. Yeah. And uh, the key is to just be upfront mm. in what you want and what you need. Yeah, Rather I, than think about it in your head but expecting the other person to know. Yeah, I think that's a very woman thing. Like, yeah. I mean, it's a very women stereotype thing that like, you should know, ma. Yeah, <laughs> they don't know. Yeah. Okay, they don't know. So just treat it as you have to educate them how to love you. Mm, yeah, educating them how to love us. Wow. Because um, as you age as a woman... Mm. You go through different seasons and your needs will change. Mm. So expectations towards life or relationships will change too. So if you are more aware of yourself, you have to communicate those changes in expectations mm. rather than keep it to yourself and expect them to know. Yeah, that's very important. Because for, for men, they're very straightforward, right? It's a yes or it's a no. Mm. If you want, tell me. Mm. If you don't want, tell me. Mm. But don't keep quiet and expect me <laughs> to know what you need. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, wow. Okay. Anything else about finances that we should kind of like be careful of? Debts. Any of you carry debts? Mm. Because when you enter the marriage, if something happened to you or him and your debts belong to each other. Yeah. Another one is future expenses when it comes to elderly parents. Yeah. That is something people don't really talk about. Yeah. But in an Asian context, it is a real deal. Mm. So is there the expectation where one of your parents, as they age, you are required to take care of them? Mm. And that would eat into your finances. Mm. You have to talk about it now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Wow, but, I've never thought about that one because I myself haven't really thought about it. Yeah. Because usually when you get into marriage, you are still in a way quite young, right? And your parents are still healthy and yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of people enter the marriage, then only they face those challenges where you know suddenly something happened to the parent mm. and it's dependent and it eats into the expenses. Mm. Or they, it causes a lot of quarrel in the marriage mm. because they're not prepared for it. Yeah. So if... You, say, for example, your partner is the eldest son. In an Asian context, eldest son carries the responsibility for mm. the welfare of the parents. Mm. So what does that look like? Talk about it. Mm. But modern parents usually would have taken care of themselves really well that they don't want to burden their kids. Mm. I think that is the generation I grew up in. Like yeah. Among my friends, we talk about when we get old, we all will buy a retirement home. We all move ourselves into it <laughs> and have a community with each other so, so we nice. don't depend on our kids. Yeah. But it's important conversations to have with your partner to know what is the expectation when it comes to taking care of parents. Yeah, I think when it comes to marriage, we always talk about just like wedding planning and having having kids instead of parents. So this is something very new to me. La. I've yeah. never really thought about it that way. But okay, important conversation, note taken to talk to Kevin about today when I go home. And funny story, her husband's name is also Kevin. And my partner's name was Kevin. So I was like, oh, my Kevin versus your Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> a common name. Yeah, it is a very, very common name. But yeah, so we were talking about values and we touched into finances. Mm -hmm. And so that's future planning in terms of like even elderly care. Anything else before we hop onto the next topic? Uh, I think in terms of financial expectations, those will, those will be the main few things. Okay. You yeah. don't want to be overwhelming each other mm. <laughs> because you don't have a lot of answers to a lot of things about the future. Yeah. But at least to kickstart those conversations is a good starting point. Yeah, I think coming into these conversations, I had so many 
concerns and what ifs that I wanted to ask you, right? But I feel like at the start of this podcast, you already gave me the key point, like, just embrace the uncertainty. Yeah. <laughs> and now I'm like, oh, should I still ask you all the questions? You that can, I can. Go for it. Mind? Go for it. Okay, so one big thing that I kind of feel like it's an important thing, but it's always very, like a huge taboo to talk about is when it comes to sex life. Mm-hmm or like sexual habits and all that. And it's because I think in an Asian context where we are raised up, it's, it's just a taboo to talk about, right? But I also believe that it is a very big part about marriage and relationship because literally that's how we have offsprings and yep. all that, right? So how important it is to talk about it and how can we start the conversation about it if it's not something that's natural to you both? Use a, uh, you know... You, the starting point is always to share how did you learn about sex, right? Uh-huh. School, like, oh, is it bio class? Or your parents actually talk to you about it? Mm. Like, have casual chats about, you know, how you feel about this topic. Mm. So don't go deep dive into, like, so... What's like, your favourite position? Yeah, yeah <laughs> what is it, right? You, 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 you are scaring oh each other, God. right? Yeah. So you want to know each other's background. So maybe someone carries that belief that, oh... Um, we will refrain from having sex until we're married, right? Yeah. So those are some of the conversations you need to have because there's also the background of beliefs, family values, um, or whether we should live together first before yeah. marriage, right? Yeah. So these are some things you want to iron out. But when I look at sexual intimacy, I always tie it with emotional intimacy. Hmm. Okay? In the beginning of relationship, you are in love with each other, right? Mm. So you only f- you are feeling all those physical feelings, yep. butterflies in your stomach, you can't get your hands off each other. But as time goes by, it is not sustainable if the emotional intimacy is not there. Mm. Right? If you don't really talk to each other, like yeah. you feel he doesn't care for you yeah. or you're not important in his life and you fail to talk to him about it, some, at some point you will withdraw yeah. because don't touch me. Right? <laughs> so that's where married couples get to at the end of their marriage when they are checked out they can't even let their partner hug them or hold their hand oh, no. now don't talk about sexual intimacy right mm. there's no longer any intimacy mm. so when we talk when we bridge the topic of sexual intimacy we have to look at it as a whole because mm. for the other person maybe physical intimacy is not that important Mm. They just don't have the drive for it. They don't think about it. Yeah, it it's like a love language thing, right? Yeah. Like for some people, they're just not mm. a physical, affectionate mm. person, mm. right? So you have to find out then what's important. Mm. It cannot be sex or physical intimacy as the most important thing that holds a relationship mm. together. Yeah. Right? There are other intimacies that could be very important to your partner. Mm. For example, financial intimacy. What if, is funny? if they are sloppy, they can't even earn money, mm. like don't have savings, like have no future in mind? Don't talk about sexual intimacy. Yeah, right? that's more important. If, if, if that need for that person is to feel secure financially and that need is not met, mm. they won't be able to get into a healthy sexual intimacy with you mm. because they don't feel safe. Mm. Right? So it could be. Another one is recreational intimacy. Mm. That do we enjoy being with each other? Mm. Right? Maybe I love doing sports with you. I love spending time with you, doing fun and adventure stuff. But if that is missing, I don't feel close to you because that is my way of being intimate with you. Mm. So sexual intimacy is not the only most important thing. Mm. Right? But it is still important. It is important, but even without it, a relationship can survive. Wow. Because if you think that's the only thing that holds a relationship together, you, you are going to have a lot of expectations being <laughs> unmet. Okay. Right? Yeah. What if one day something happened to one of you and you know, physical intimacy is not possible? Ooh. Yeah. Does that mean, ah, oh, that's it? <laughs> right? Yeah. No, that's where you have to look at the other forms of intimacy. Mm. It is all important. Yeah. Wow. Right? And this is something I, I only recently could articulate it clearer. Mm-hmm. Because I always came from the background of, yeah, sexual intimacy and emotional intimacy are the most important. But in a long-term marriage, I find 
couples struggle with this too. So when these two are gone, can the marriage still survive? Yes, if you start building on other important intimacies as well. Mm -hmm. For example, if they are both committed towards raising the house or the family, right? And they are both aligned in the financial expectations of it. That's intimacy. Mm. It doesn't mean without sex, oh, we're not intimate anymore. Mm. You could be aligning in other areas too. Yeah. So in down hard seasons, yeah. that's where you need to rely on those other types of intimacy to rebuild the physical part of it. Okay. Yeah, but I feel like maybe we live in a more open-minded season mm. where people are just more open about their sex life mm. and their expectations toward it. And mm. I feel like with you know pornography and everything else becoming so much more easily accessible to people, they have certain expectations when it comes to sexual intimacy, right? Yeah. And so then, like, like you said, lah, like the emphasis towards a, sexual, a healthy sexual life becomes so much more important yes. and prevalent. Right? And I think the... the underlying thing would be communication and honesty mm. and just now you touch on pornography mm. it actually is a huge problem mm. for long term relationships mm. because of comparisons because of unmet expectations unmet needs or the other partner that knows the partner is you know is hooked on pornography they feel they're not good enough mm. like they're, they're never enough or they're inadequate mm. But to that partner who is hooked on pornography, maybe that's not the case. It was just something they've gotten used to, became a habit that they struggle mm. to get out of. So then it comes with different type of struggles. Mm. That's why you have to rely on other forms of intimacy to rebuild the trust. Mm. And also communication, right? Mm. Like I think if I were able to be, if I were to be, able to understand that my partner is just used to this certain lifestyle of engaging in pornography, right? And watching it and knowing that it's not my problem, then I don't think it's a problem, right? If you're able to communicate it well. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it's hard for someone to tell you, oh yeah, I, I'm into porn. <laughs> you get what I mean? It, yeah. it takes a level of safety yeah. and security for someone to open up their most vulnerable part. Yeah. All right. So... If, even if you're okay with it or not okay with it, communicating how it affects you is important, but not judging the other person because you cannot change the other person. Mm. You cannot tell them, no, I don't agree with it, quit it. Mm. It's hard. It doesn't come from them. It comes from you. You want them to change. If they don't want to change, there's nothing you can do. But yeah. you can let them know how it affects you. Yeah. So that is working on what's within your control. Mm. Right, by communicating your needs. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, I, I always find it very hard to talk about sex in front of my podcast or whatsoever. I was like, eh. <laughs> I mean, it's a good topic to touch on uh, mm. in our cultural context. Mm. It's hard to talk about it. Mm. Um, so I always have anonymous questions. I get some of these intimacy questions mm. on sex a lot. Yeah. Right when it's anonymous, people just have these questions. So I think it's a good thing you're having this podcast. Yeah. For some of them to really bridge this topic in their relationship. Yeah. Because it is Because like, it's a very shy taboo thing to talk about. Yeah, especially like when you are raised in an Asian context and all that, right? It's yeah, and like, you know, my fear of like, oh my mom hears my podcast and uh, <laughs> and because Is she hearing? I, I don't think so. So <laughs> so I think it's good. I think it's good. Let me get her number and share your podcast. <laughs> hey, with don't her. don't get into that mom mode, okay? <laughs> um but yeah, like on the topic of say talking about sexual expectations and all that before marriage, right? What about your sexual history? Um, okay. Is this something that um, you should talk to your partner about before the marriage. Um, what are your advice on dealing with that? <laughs> uh, my healthy advice would be when you want to enter into a relationship with this person, you should start from a blank piece of paper. Mm. That means this is our starting point. Mm. But they, if they insist of wanting to know the history, you got to be sure whether they could take it. Mm. Right? Because when someone wants to know all the details that happen in the history, right, and it's in the past, and the more they know, the more they start to overthink or compare themselves with your past, mm. 
you're going to get into a lot of trouble yeah. because there's nothing you do that could change the past, right? But yeah. they hold you on it. Yeah. It's because they can't overcome their own insecurities after knowing all the details. Yeah. So if you want to start the relationship right, it should start from a place of honesty that starts from this line, mm. right? Mm. Of our dating history, mm. our own dating history. Mm-mm. Nothing about other people. That's true. I, I, that's, that's my thought too. I just feel mm. like the past should not matter as much. So if you were to ask me, I would say, I don't think it's necessary to talk about it. But if my partner demands to know about it, then I would probably ask him like, would you be able to take it or not? Mm. First, right? Before I actually like talk about it, right? Yeah. Or yeah, like I think for me, my stent is like, it shouldn't matter. But I think for some people, it does. It does, especially if they got cheated before. Oh. Right? You now, some people really carry deep trauma mm. where they got cheated again and again and again. And when they get into this relationship, they just want to know for sure you're not going to cheat on me. Mm. Hence, they want to know the details because they're so used to digging and investigating like a private investigator, oh. right? And to dig on the phone, to find past history, past chats that happened five years ago, like to know what kind of person you are because they come with a traumatic experience. Yeah. So then, if you're dating someone like that, you have to be prepared, you have to provide a lot of reassurance. Mm. Right? Yeah. But like, for me, it's like, past history doesn't mean anything for future data also, right? Mm. So I was like, okay, but mm. yeah, I guess, I guess it makes sense for some people that like, it it helps them to be aware of certain information. Yeah. It's, it's very hard if you keep holding someone else onto their past. Yeah. It's like they cannot move on. They want to move on with you, but you don't allow them to move on. And you keep questioning their motive of the past. Hmm. Actually, there's nothing else they can do other than create a time, time, time travel machine to go back there and change that Yeah, because history. past is past and we all learn from our mistake. That's why I don't always think that the past is a good... It gives you a good picture of what you would get in the future. La. Mm. I think at least that's for me. La. So, if you take the responsibility to build yourself emotionally healthy, mm. I think that's every individual's responsibility. Yeah. Right? You, you cannot rely on your partner to make you feel secure if yeah. you are not secure on your own. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that kind of brings us back to the topic. Previously, you were mentioning like women these days, we are a lot more, like in a way, we receive higher educations, we are more career driven, and we are given all these opportunities to do things that finally we are able to do. Mm. And I feel like I'm surrounded by a lot of women who are very powerful and very strong because I'm a very ambitious woman myself. And um, I think for us, coming into marriage becomes a little bit more scary now. Yes. Um, because the marriages that we've seen are from the past generations and values are very different. Times were very different. Our mothers, our grandmothers did not have the opportunities that we have, right? Mm. And so like coming into all these conversations about marriage and all that, there's always been this big concern of like, I think generally we feel we are more mature than our male counterparts, lah. Right? And there's this big fear of like, what if our boyfriends will never become a man <laughs> to take care of us? Mm. And I think, like, I, I don't know what's the right word, but like, in our survival instinct, we just generally want to find a male counterpart that can really provide and take care for us. And how would you, I guess like, what do you have to say about this? If... If you are someone powerful, capable, high achieving, and it's possible that you could be a higher income earner yeah. than your male part, counterpart, right? Partner. Mm. Then it is something you have to acknowledge now that differences. Mm. And are you okay with that, that dynamic? Mm. Because you cannot expect them to maybe climb as fast as you if you keep achieving. Mm. which is the drive of most high achievers. Yeah. Right, so if they can, no, can never catch up, but no, they, are, they have a good hardworking spirit, mm. I think that's something good to accept mm. because every high achieving woman, at the end of the day, when they go home, they don't want to face another high achieving man arguing with them. When you go home, you think about it. Actually, what do you want? 
you just want a calm, stable, loving environment. Mm. And you attract those men. Mm. And those men might not be as high achieving as you. Mm. So that is a harsh reality that women in powerful positions have to accept first. Mm. If you can't, then stay single. Yeah. <laughs> you get what I mean? Yeah. Right? Because you cannot keep thinking, oh, they're just useless. They, how come they don't earn as much? How, how are they going to take care of me? Mm. But our society has changed. Yeah. Right? And it's very common that some women earn way more than men. Mm. And they're totally fine with it. But their dynamic at home will be very different from the usual dynamic. Right? So maybe dynamic at home, the partner will be the more um, homey person. Mm. They can they can cook, they can take care of the kids, yeah. right? While you get to go out and, you know, strive. That works too. Yeah. But you have to accept it. Yeah. And not start to compare him with other high achieving men that you meet out there. How come you cannot be like that? Yeah. Then that's not fair because you started from a point where they're just not like that. They're just that calm, chill dude that loves hanging out with you at home. Mm. Yeah. Then don't don't go five years and start questioning why can't you do more? Yeah. It's really not fair for them. Yeah, I, I, I get it <laughs> lah. And you know, my mom always reminds me because I sometimes would complain to her. It's like, oh, yo, Kevin cooked the food too salty lah. Or like when he fold the clothes, he fold it, it's very messy lah. My mom's like, you're very lucky already. Your partner does yeah. all of these things, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it's just like, okay, you need to be reminded that, mm. okay, this is a choice. Mm. I think really marriage and wedding is really like, yeah, it's, it's a choice that you commit to. Mm. Right. You don't marry somebody hoping they can be somebody else. Yeah. In your dream, you know, in your desire, in your secret desire, mm. you have to marry them and love them for who they are now, mm. like in their state right now, mm. and then grow together. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And you have to be prepared. You are the dominant one. Mm. That means, in terms of leadership in the relationship, the high achieving woman probably takes a lot more lead. Mm. Then don't go, how come they don't lead? Ah? I wish they would lead more. Mm. Stop saying those things because that dynamic never existed. Mm. Right? And high achieving women are natural leaders. So they're dominant, they're outspoken. Yeah. They are commanders, they command people. Yeah. Right? I, I feel like you're describing <laughs> everything else. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> right? Uh, no, because I've met a lot. Yeah. Right? And it's something you have to accept with yourself first that, hey, I'm that. Mm. So I expect my partner to be my team player and we play to our strengths. Mm. So if he, he cooks, he does you know, laundry and stuff like that and he is just very um, neat, tidy, maybe that's his department, yeah. right? So everybody will have something they're good at. Yeah. So you just have to create that system that works uniquely for your relationship. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay. Thank you so much for everything that you've shared. And as we wrap up this episode, right, what advice do you have for couples that are getting ready for their wedding or their marriage? Before you talk about the wedding day, um, couples should invest in wedding preparation, like marriage preparation, mm. right? There are many premarital costs around. Like, just spend the time to go through it because it might bring out different conversations that you might never had a chance to have before. Mm. Right? Like even this podcast alone, the fact that I could bring out so many different topics is because I know these are important, mm. right? And I can draw that out to talk about. But some other couples, maybe they don't have that circle. Yeah. Right? And their friends, most of them are not married. Yeah. So they don't they really don't know what it takes to build a marriage. So invest yourself in really learning what does it take to build a marriage before you even plan for your wedding date yeah. or the wedding itself? Mm. I think that would be the best gift uh, anyone can give to their future marriage. Right? Okay. Thank you so much, Esther, for this episode. If you guys love what Esther shared, 
in today's episode. You can follow her on Instagram. I personally, she's the only relationship account that I follow. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I've learned a lot from it, seriously. Uh, so do check her out. Uh, I will share her Instagram handle in our show notes. And I hope that you find this episode to be very valuable and it helps you to prepare for your marriage or your future marriage or to share it with your friends and family who might need it as well. Um, so thank you so much, Esther, for coming over. Thank you for having me. It was a fun conversation. Yeah, it is. Okay, and we will see you in the next episode. Bye!